This video is going to be a response to the TED Talk called The Line Between Life and Not Life. Um, I was asked by one of my viewers to do a video response on this. And basically, the speaker in the video was talking about something called protocells, which he defined as a simple chemical model of a living cell. Uh, these protocells, basically what they were, were droplets of oil that had a few chemicals added to them so that they would have a chemical reaction with the environment so that when this chemical reaction occurs they'll move around in the environment. Um, now this is very very interesting work uh, but it's not as interesting as what most of the viewers thought. Um, it's what's happening is not that this gentleman has created life in a test tube it's just that we've taken some oil drop, or that he has taken some oil droplets, added some chemicals to them, also took a watery environment, added some chemicals to that so that the little droplets of oil end up dancing around. Um, and he has said that this is a model of lifelike properties. Now, basically, um, there's a lot of problems with these claims because the only resemblance these cells these quote-unquote protocells have to actual living things is that they're round and they move around. Um, that's basically all that's going on is you have an oil droplet with, with a chemical reaction going on that's making it move around. Now depending on what chemicals he added to the environment and what chemicals he added to the oil droplets, the cells, the quote-unquote protocells, uh, moved around in uh, different ways. And But at the end of the day, the only thing that these protocells have to do with life is that they're round and they move around. That's it. Um, they don't self-replicate in any meaningful sense of the term. Um, they're not able to do the things that we would consider a life form to be able to do. Um, they don't have any, the ones that he was showing moving around, don't have any genetic information, so they're not able to undergo mutation and natural selection in order to develop into a gradually more and more complex thing. Um, so what we have here is not a self-reproducing molecule. What we have here is basically drop of, drops of oil that move around in an environment because of a chemical reaction. It's really not that exciting. It's basically when you, an everyday equivalent would be like when you take a thing of Italian salad dressing, shake it up, you'll see little droplets of oil uh, that will fuse and break apart. Um, yeah, that's, and the oil will move around. Basically, this experiment was just glorified salad dressing. Um, he put in, he did, he used some chemistry to make this, make the droplets of oil move around, and he called them protocells, and that's, that's basically what this is, but this really doesn't have anything to do with the, uh, with the origin of life. Um, in fact, uh, here, let me read you a quote. Alright, this is a paragraph from a Nature article where this wasn't a research article, this was more of a news article that was published in Nature. So this wasn't a journal research paper like where somebody did an experiment and then turned around and reported the results, uh, reported their conclusions, things like that. This was just more of a news article in Nature. And one of the paragraphs, uh, they were talking about the comments of a another origin of life researcher who is uh, very highly respected in this field and he said um, the paragraph said uh, he you meaning the other origin of life researcher um, he seems bemused by Hans's six I apologize I cannot pronounce this gentleman's name um, he he seems bemused by the TED talk speaker oil-based approach and this is a quote. It's an interesting, simple system, he says. I don't see any relevance to the origin of life, but you never know. Um, basically, like I said, all this is is some oil droplets with a chemical reaction going on, so they're moving around. Um, this has nothing to do with the predecessor to a living cell any more than a skateboard here. here. Actually, let me give you a bit of an analogy. I think this will help. To take these protocells and compare these to a living system would be like, originally I was going to say, like taking a skateboard and comparing this to 
an automobile. However, the problem is much, 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 much worse than this. This would be like taking a skateboard and comparing this to some type of machine that is able to make copies of itself, something that has this sophisticated technology where it's able to build its own components and able uh, from scratch, from iron ore, and able to take those components and assemble those into another machine, another copy of itself, and then able to take that take this robot's computer program and pass this on to other copies of itself. Now, obviously, this type of sophistication would require an incredible amount of design. Um, and you might say, well, this is a metaphor and, you know, maybe the simple cells early in the Earth's history were more complex, were, were, were not as complex as modern day cells. However, that's where you'd be wrong uh, because it's been found by scientists that we need to have at least a few hundred proteins just to have a basic living cell that is able to self-replicate and able to take able to take energy from the environment, able to reproduce, able to do all the very basic things to survive, reproduce, and go on to potentially, allegedly, go on to be able to evolve. Um, so that's ba basically that's the problem with this protocell analogy all we have is a few oil droplets moving around in the environment we don't have a truly self-replicating system now at one point the speaker showed us something that he called a quote-unquote self-replication event um, however basically uh, what was happening was all we had was two drops of the moving oil moving around in the environment and they ended up coming together fusing made a big drop of olive oil and you still had the chemical reaction moving around um, but the forces of the chemical reaction ended up breaking apart and you ended up having two molecules again this really wasn't a self-replication event in any meaningful sense of the term um, all this was was two drops of oil coming together and then later uh, then forming a big droplet of oil and then this big droplet of oil breaking apart. Um, this is no different than when you take a thing of salad dressing, shake it up, and then you see a bunch of uh, oil droplets that form. Uh, some of them will come together, some of them will break apart. Um, you'll see this sort of thing all the time, but that's, that's all that was. That wasn't a true self-replication event. Um, these One of the criticisms of his work is that these protocells don't have any genetic material, they're not able to reproduce in any meaningful sense of the word, they don't have it where they don't have a genetic material that can mutate and mutate and undergo natural selection. If you take one of these protocells and put it into an environment with uh, all kinds of resources, it's not going to turn around and make a million copies of itself the way a cell, the way a like E. coli would if you put an E. coli cell into a petri dish. Now let me read you a quote from the Nature article that I mentioned before. I think that'll help to explain things. But biochemists argue that the lack of genetic information in the droplet means that they would never develop into anything more complex. You need to put software into the hardware, says Philip Halliger of the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, UK, who recently suggested that before cells evolved, RNA could have replicated within liquid-filled micro compartments inside ice. Hans Sizek disagrees. I think you will get quite complex structures, he says. You don't have DNA or RNA, but the necessary information is embedded in the chemistry of the system. Characteristics would be, and then it, that's the end quote there, characteristics would be passed to daughter droplets on division, though he concedes that without being formally encoded, these would be dependent on the environment and could easily be lost. Um, basically, the criticism of Mr. of uh, Dr. H, um, and I apologize, uh, sir, that I can't pronounce your last name if you ever see this video. Um, and basically, the criticism of uh, his work does stand because all you have, if you have, if you just have a bunch of droplets of oil forming and breaking apart, uh, yeah, you might have some change. You might have. Um, you might have some type of, if you have an oil droplet, you might have some other molecule to diffuse inside of that oil droplet, uh, but you're going to end up running out of that. Um, basically, all you have is oil moving around and 
that's that's it. You don't have it where you can self-replicate and you can make changes. Um, and even if you did, I mean, these cha these changes that are being made really wouldn't be permanent. You don't have any. You're not encoding these things. All this is is a bunch of chemical reactions moving around in the environment, and that's life is far more complex than that. That really doesn't um, that really doesn't explain how we would be able to get life. Now, at one point in the video, the speaker did talk about how well, some of these protocells are starting to add RNA and things like this to them. And this is interesting work. You know, people have done other things like this before. They've taken proteins and added these to lipid spheres. Um, and they've used this to isolate biochemical reactions. And this is important work. This is stuff that helps teach us about biochemistry. Um, however, there's this really wouldn't have anything to do with the origin of life. Um, Taking RNA that we already have and adding this to a lipid sphere doesn't show how we could go from a lipid sphere all the way to a living cell. Even if we were able to take a ton of components from a living cell and able to have it self-replicate and able to have the lipid sphere self-replicate, um, then that really wouldn't show how we were able to get a true living cell from going from chemicals to a living cell that really wouldn't show abiogenesis. And here, let me give you a illustration to try to explain why. Comparing these protocells to a living cell is like taking a toaster and comparing these to one of the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. Obviously, it's a completely ridiculous idea. Now, the speaker in the TED Talk did talk about how they are taking RNA and adding these to um, adding these to some of the protocells. Now maybe you could also take enzymes, different proteins, things like that. Uh, you could potentially take things from living systems like RNA, DNA, proteins, uh, or uh, especially enzymes. You could take all these things and add these to a living system, but that would be like taking a Cylon and using its components and going and building a toaster uh, from them. Potentially you could take a Cylon and deconstruct it and then take these different machine parts and use them to go build an actual toaster. Um, however, this is to say that this demonstrates how we could go from non-living systems to a living system would be quite silly. I mean, this would uh, obviously this would be ridiculous. This would be like taking the toaster or building, taking the Cylon, building the toaster, and then saying this proves that the toaster could have formed. Uh, very early in Earth's history, or in this case in Caprica's history, and then even though the toaster can't reproduce, just like these protocells can't truly reproduce, uh, this toaster, or the protocells, gradually developed into a true cell, or into a Cylon, uh, which was able to develop into all the Cylons or, or, and all of the cells that we ended up seeing later on in history. Um, obviously the idea is completely silly, and it's uh, kind of ridiculous to think that one of these protocells that can't even self-replicate would be able to turn around and develop into a true living cell. It's just as silly as thinking that one of these toasters could gradually develop uh, on its own with no intelligent guidance into one of the Cylons we see from Battlestar Galactica. Um, this is this is what it is. I mean, this uh, the two ideas are just as silly and just as ridiculous. So to summarize what I've said about the protocells and just bring it all together, basically all these are is little drops of oil that move around and sometimes they fuse together and sometimes they break apart. That's all that they are. They're oil droplets that because of a chemical reaction are able to move around in the environment and sometimes move around in different ways. That's basically it. Um, even if you add a biologic, even if you take something from a living cell and add these to the protocells, all that does is show that you can take something from a very complex system and use it to go build a more simple system using your intelligence. It doesn't show how you would be able to take something like a protocell and develop that into a true living cell. Um, now, the speaker did go on to talk, did at one point actually, he didn't go on to talk about, he talked about it earlier in the video. He talked about how he was able to take a cell membrane break it apart and then all the part the cell membrane ended up coming back together again and reforming itself and yes 
this happens. Um, every cell biology student knows this. Every biochemistry student knows this. Um, however, this is not as exciting as what it would sound to a lay person. This does not prove that a cell membrane could have developed by random chemical interactions. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. If you have a cell mem if you have a cell membrane and you break this apart, um, the different components of the cell membrane are actually repelled by the water in the environment. So because the water is repelling the different components, that ends up forcing the components to come together. You have the hydrophilic part of the cell membrane, the outside, and you have the hydrophobic, which is more the uh, more the intermediate part of the cell membrane here. Let me draw you a picture. What we are seeing here is a simplified drawing of a cell membrane. Now remember, in real life cell membranes are a lot more complex than this. Um, entire departments of universities are set aside to study just cell membranes. Now, if you look at this picture, you will see some larger structures. They look kind of like a squiggly blob. Uh, those are the proteins in the cell membrane. Now remember, they are actually very complex and very highly ordered. They have to be constructed in just the right way, otherwise they won't function properly. Um, now you also see the phospholipids. So those are the tiny little spheres with two squiggly lines coming out of each one. Those have a portion that is attracted to the water, so that the sphere, the phospholipid head, is attracted to the water, whereas the tails, those little squiggly lines, are repelled by the water, so they're attracted to each other. So you can imagine if you have a bunch of these and you stir them around in an aqueous solution, they will attract to each other. If we take the different components of a cell membrane and we break them apart, yes, we can break these apart and they will come back together and form back into spheres again that will look kind of like a cell membrane. Um, however, they won't be highly ordered as a cell membrane is supposed to be. For example, the proteins might be pointing in the wrong direction. Uh, they might be on the wrong side of the lipid uh, membrane. Remember, it takes a whole team of molecules, an incredible number of molecules in the cell, proteins, enzymes, etc., in order to make sure that everything is pointing in the right direction, everything's on the right side of the cell membrane, you have the right phospholipids on the outside and the right phospholipids on the inside, the cell membrane is very, very complex. You're not going to form this by chance. Now, if we take a look at the proteins, uh, for example, um, one protein might be a thousand amino acids long, and those amino acids need to be in just the right order in order to have a properly functioned protein. This is not something you're going to get by chance. Now, Will these different components attract to each other and form back into spheres? Like I said, yes, they will. However, does this, but does this prove that you could take a bunch of chemicals in the laboratory and mix them together and end up getting a cell membrane? Um, the answer to that is just plain no. Um, you're not going to get these proteins by chance. You're not going to get the you might potentially be able to form phospholipids um, if you do your chemistry just right. However, a, just a phospholipid bilayer would not be a cell membrane. A cell membrane is actually a very, very complex structure. and needs to be put together in just the right way. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you're not going to have anything that's relevant to biology. You're not going to have anything that's relevant to the origin of life. Now, in summary, if you take the components of a cell membrane and break them apart from each other, Will they come back together and reassemble into a sphere? Yes. Will this be as highly ordered as a cell membrane? Is no. Uh, does this prove that a does the fact that the individual components of a cell membrane, uh, the lipids and the proteins, does the fact that they will assemble spontaneously into a sphere because they're attract physically attracted to each other and repelled by the water, does that prove that uh, cell membranes? Um, does that prove that they could have formed naturally? And the answer is no. Uh, for example, we need the proteins. Uh, we might be able to potentially in the laboratory to form uh, some of the phospholipids. Possibly. Uh, possibly. Um, they're relatively simple compared to a protein, for example, compared to DNA, compared to RNA. Phospholipids are relatively simple. Um, however, having a protein, which you would undeniably need in a cell membrane, Having that form by chance um, and getting the first life forms, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, now here's why. 
The odds of forming one protein of about a thousand amino acids by chance is one out of 20 to the thousandth power. Now, a lot of you will say, well, this is a big universe that's been around for a long time, so maybe through millions and billions of years, the odds of getting a protein, uh, potentially, maybe that could happen by chance. Now, the problem with that is one out of 20 to the thousandth power. Uh, let's just to show you how small those odds are. There are only 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire universe. So if you were to take all the atoms in the entire universe, throw them into a hat, and you were to pick out just the one that had your name written on it blindly, that you would have better odds of doing that um, than to get one single protein by chance. Um, so. The odds are the odds are quite significant, and I'll go into more deep. I've gone into more detail in earlier videos, and I plan to make a future video on this as well. Um, now, some of you might say, "Well, maybe potentially you might astronomically get that one protein," and the odds of that are astronomically unreasonably small. We um, in even in civilized countries, we put people to death for smaller for uh, smaller evidences than that. I mean if one out of 20 to the thousandth power is a very large number. Um, however, let's grant that you did form one protein, one enzyme or one uh, one membrane protein, you know one of these things. Say you did form one of these by chance. Scientists have found that, and this is published in the mainstream scientific literature, scientists have found that you need hundreds of different proteins at a minimum just have a cell that is able to live and survive and reproduce. Uh, the most basic, the, mo the simplest cell you could possibly have that is still able to survive, still able to reproduce, needs to have hundreds of different proteins. Now, these aren't creationists publishing these numbers. These are hardcore evolutionists um, who are trying to figure out how could simple life have formed on the early Earth. And what they have found and they publish this in mainstream scientific journals, um, which is kind of an embarrassment to the idea that you could get life from non-life. They have found that you need hundreds of different proteins just to have the simplest living cell. All right, so what does all of this mean? Uh, bringing it all together, basically, you don't have. There is no chance that cell membranes are going to form by chance. Uh, the fact that s different components of a cell membrane are attracted to each other and will reform into a sphere when you break them apart um, does not prove that cell membranes could have formed spontaneously in the early Earth or early on any other planet for that matter. Um, also, the fact that this scientist was able to take some oil droplets and make them dance around does not prove that you have a protocell, uh, which is it's really kind of uh, inappropriate to call these protocells. Um, it doesn't prove that you have a protocell. It doesn't prove that life could have formed spontaneously on the early Earth. Um, all this proves is that through a chemical reaction, you're able to take little droplets of oil and able to make them move around, and able to make them move around in some interesting ways. But at the end of the day, all this is is some interesting chemistry. This has nothing to do with forming a simple living cell because, well, that's all this is, is a little chemical reaction. We don't have a self-reproducing system. We don't have anything that mutation and natural selection can act on. We don't have anything that could even potentially, even in a Darwinian uh, worldview, this could not evolve into a cell. This could not evolve into a bacterium or an archaea or any, any eukaryote uh, to go on and develop into prokaryotes, to go on to develop into, eventually, into everything we see today on the earth. Um, this, we don't have, even if that's true, the evidence for that is not here. It is not evident in this video. Um, and so, basically, is this interesting? Yes. Does this show how life could have formed on the early earth? Uh, the bottom line is, no, it, it doesn't. Um, as, as one person, uh, one person posted in the video he thinks that God is out of the job now and well even if you don't believe in God uh, no he's not out of the job uh, 
because this doesn't these experiments don't really prove anything in that regard um, so anyway uh, subscribe comment rate uh, check out my other videos uh, check out my website uh, greenslug.com and remember slug is spelled with two G's um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day uh, may God bless you all uh, may God bless our country and every country in the world um, this is Greg out